Hello, hello, hello. Happy Thursday. Welcome. Hey guys, Dr. S here. Oh my gosh. Okay, two weeks is a long time. In my mind, <laughs> it made sense. Can space things out, wouldn't be so stressed out, but I feel like I haven't seen you guys in forever. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Come on in. Thank you guys for joining me via Facebook as well as Instagram. Um, as I mentioned before, I will try to keep these to 30 minutes. So looking forward to getting started. Feel free to share, tag, say hi. All of the great, wonderful things that people do when they come on to live. So I am going to give it a few moments for people to hang out, join, um, say hey. While folks are doing that, I wanted to mention just a few things. So um, again, Dr. S here, dropping nuggets you didn't know you needed. And as always, it is my hope and prayer that they will help you be your best you. Um, so a couple of things I want to mention before we get into tonight's word of mouth with Dr. S and our quarterly series, The Real Housewives of the Bible. I want to mention that my latest book, Love Letters to Our Sons, is available. You can check it out at drchalet.com slash shop to get your copy. It's only $10. Um, the pre-sale went really well. The book signing went really well. Um, people are continuing to order. So thank you so much for that. Um, and the feedback that I have been getting has been extremely positive. So if you've ordered your book, if you've gotten your book, take a picture of yourself with your book, put it on social media, tag me, and encourage other people to go out and get a copy for their son, grandson, godson, regardless of their age, whether they're young, you know, young adult, older, old, all the good things. So I want to mention that. And then I also want to mention that just yesterday or the day before, registration opened up for Roar Like a Lioness. Yes, Roar Like a Lion is Women's Conference. That is happening on April the 15th. I am ecstatic, elated, overjoyed, over the top um, that our third annual Roar Like a Lion is um, Women's Conference is about to go down. So this year's theme is um, Baggage Claim, Girl, Get Your Bag. It's going to be a full day um, of speakers and prayer and deliverance and praise and worship and all of the things. And so that is going to be a phenomenal time. Um, you can also, again, head over to drchalet.com um, and click on the events tab to get your seat. Um, that is 50 bucks and that includes a lunch if you register before April 1st. We also, again, have t-shirts this year who I didn't mention this in the post and I should have our very own Anita Hayes helped with um, getting those t-shirts together. So if you're interested in that, be sure when you register to um, sign up to get your t-shirt. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Hey, Naja, your birthday's coming. Are you excited? Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. And before I do, though, if you are hanging out, and so it's a whole lot going on on my screen, so I can't see, like, who's on if people are on. Um, but if you are on, you're watching, go ahead and put in the comments who you think tonight's real housewife is. I want to mention a couple other um, very exciting things that are coming up before I get started. And that is, um, I don't know if Dr. MC is on, but Dr. MC um, is starting her first cohort of her virtual course, um, Divorcing the World, that starts on Monday. So I think she's running a special through tomorrow. Um, so definitely, if you're not already following her, check out um, Dr. MC, Dr. Marlena Clark on Facebook. Um, I think it's the same on Instagram. 
Check her out to find out more about her Divorcing the World course. I know I'm registered, super excited to participate. Another thing that's coming up at the end of this month um, is the Jewel Warrior Conference. That's a weekend getaway retreat women's conference um, from the 24th to the 26th. And I know several lionesses um, will be there in um you know, attending as well as participating and, and doing different things. It's always a, a great time. Very diverse crowd, very eclectic. Everybody love it on Jesus. That's great. I think that registration is, is ending soon. So you can check them out at Jewel Warrior on Facebook and I think on IG too. And then the last thing um, I want to mention while you guys are um, thinking about who's our real housewife for tonight is um, my friend Drea. Um, Taylor is hosting a conference and concert next month. Yes, because it's February. Next month on the 11th, um, Pain, Purpose, Promise. And she's going to have Casey J, who I know and love. And if you guys have not ever heard of her, just go to your YouTube or whoever, Siri, Google, who, however you listen to music, and search KCJ. Phenomenal, phenomenal. So if you're in the area and you want to check out that conference, be sure to look up Drea Taylor um, on Facebook and Instagram as well. So no guesses yet, um, but if you're watching the hashtag replay, you can still comment before you find out who it is, who you think it is. So I'm going to go ahead and get into it. So last time, so two weeks ago, we talked about Miriam and we learned some new and different things. Maybe, maybe new, maybe different. They were new and different to me about her. And tonight I want to talk about another kind of, I was going to say like unsung hero, but that might not be like the way to say it. Um, maybe I think someone who we don't necessarily talk about as much um, in the Bible. And so I wanted to bring her up and I would love to get your thoughts again, whether you're watching it real time or in the real on the replay about her. So, um, one of the women in the Bible who I, um, I don't know, like I just kind of feel for her sometimes and I wanted to talk about her and get your thoughts is Orpa. Who knows who Orpa is? Because we don't really talk about her a whole lot. Orpa. So Orpa, if you don't know, is the sister-in-law of Ruth the daughter-in-law of Naomi and so many of us you know we know we can I feel like we can quote Ruth backwards and forwards um and tell you all about you know what she said to Naomi and how she followed her and you know ended up being in the you know talk about Boaz and the lineage of of Jesus and all of this good stuff but we do not talk about Orpah like at all <laughs> so I want to talk about her a little bit so as I mentioned she is the daughter-in-law of Naomi sister-in-law of Ruth and she was married to one of um, Naomi's son um, Killian so just to give you a little you know background um, in the book of Ruth in um, chapter 1 verse 4 up to that point, it mentions there was a famine in um, the land in Israel. So, Bible scholars, what's Naomi's husband's name, um, took them to Moab. So, we pick up in verse 4 where it says their sons, Naomi's husband and her sons, took Moabite wives the name of one was Orpa, and the name of the other Ruth, and they lived there. So all of this family together lived there in Moab for 10 years. Now, when I read that, I thought, well, what can we learn about Orpa? Well, I feel like one thing we learned is that she's traditional in the sense that she got married. Like, we don't know how old she was or any of those kind of things, but... 
you know, we think of um, the children of Israel being given in marriage and all those kind of things. So even though the, the family has transplanted to Moab, they are still following the kind of law and the tradition and Orpah, like Ruth, was willing to go along with that. So I felt like that kind of meant she was kind of traditional and willing to abide by and adhere to kind of societal expectations. It wasn't like she was out here like, I don't need no man or, you know, anything like that. And even though they were not of her um, background, obviously they were not Moabites. They were Israelites. And I don't want to get ahead of ahead of myself, but she was willing to marry into this family. So then we go down just a little bit more and we get to verses uh, six and seven and it says, so at this point, so between four, verse four and verse six, a lot of things happen. Excuse me, Naomi's husband dies and her two sons die. Now we don't know how they died. We don't know what happened. We'll, we'll, you know, leave it up to our imagination. But at this point, they've passed away. So Naomi is like, what are we going to do? So verse 6 and 7 says, Then Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had blessed his people in Judah by giving them good crops again. Because again, they moved to Moab because there was a famine. There was a drought. There was no food um, in Israel, in Judah in particular, where they were from. But now she's heard, you know, 10 some odd years later that the Lord has restored. He's bringing back. And so she's like, my husband's dead. My sons are gone. This is not where I'm from. Let me head back. So Naomi and her daughter-in-laws got ready to leave Moab to return to her, Naomi's homeland. And with her two daughter-in-laws, she set out from the place where she had been living. And they took the road that would lead them back to Judah. So, we know, at least in, in my interpretation of what I read about Orpa, is, you know, she's willing to kind of follow the expectations of society. She's traditional in that way. And so, I feel like her willingness to even get on this road and start on this path and start on this journey shows that this kind of lifestyle or this way of thinking is continuing again wasn't like she got married and was like "Ooh, i don't want to deal with you all and now i have the opportunity to not deal with you all anymore and so uh, I'm, I'm gonna pass up like she was willing to go with naomi and i think that's one of those areas where she doesn't get the credit that she um maybe could get it's because she was willing oprah was willing to go along with Naomi, back to her homeland, back to Naomi's homeland. Um, but along the way, next verse, verse 8, Naomi says this to both of them. But on the way, Naomi said to her two daughter-in-laws, go back to your mother's homes and may the Lord reward you for your kindness to your husbands and to me. So we have Naomi, Orpa, and Ruth on the road getting ready to go back to Judah. And Naomi, in her wisdom, says, mm, I don't know, maybe you all shouldn't go. And if you read on, she talks about, you know, I'm old and even if I did get married again and even if I did have sons again, you know, you guys would be so much older than they would be. And so, you know, you're really not going to be able to lead a life or live a life um, that you could lead. So it's cool. Go, go back. She blesses them. She gives her permission for them to go back, which I think is important um, as we continue to talk about Oprah and just kind of the bad rap that I feel like she gets. I also realized, because I looked up, like, well, what, what is supposed to happen? In traditional Israelite custom, what is supposed to happen if it is a mom and her daughter-in-laws? Where are the, what are the daughter-in-laws actually supposed to do? 
And so I found this scripture in Genesis, Genesis 38, verse 11, where it says um, Judah is saying to his daughter-in-law, so slightly different. So mom to daughter-in-law is now Judah is talking to his daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law Tamar. And he says, live as a widow in your father's household until my son Shayla grows up for he thought Judah thought he may die too just like his brother so Tamar went to live in her father's household so here is another Old Testament example of when a woman is a widow and she's young returning back to her family of origin so it wasn't like when Orpah made the decision to go back that she was like doing something radical unheard of unprecedented you know completely against the grain like she was doing something that perhaps had been done frequently often regularly and so not the shock that maybe we now present it as so now when we in my opinion, and I would love to hear your thoughts. So if you're hanging out with me now, tell me what you think. Love to hear that. I feel like oftentimes when we talk about the book of Ruth and we talk about her faithfulness to Naomi, I think it is great and wonderful and a blessing. And it God knew and he ordered her steps and all of that. And sometimes, though, when we talk about Ruth, we talk about um orpa as like the opposite like it's black or white or this or that and not a both and not where um hey sis not where um both can coincide and be equally okay does that make sense so that was one part of the reason why i really want to talk about her is to to maybe go a little bit deeper than we go sometimes so um so far, what we can kind of glean, at least again, in my opinion, in this um, Bible study-ish type um, lesson on the Real Housewives of the Bible. Um, <laughs> you are funny. I'm talking, about, I'm talking about even better housewives, the ones of the Bible. Um, we've learned that... Orpa was, you know, traditional. She was willing to follow along with society's expectations of her. She was willing to follow Naomi until Naomi gave her an out, blessed her, and said, you know what, it's okay. Go back to um, your family's house. And so what can we learn from Orpa and her situation so as I mentioned sometimes when we talk about her if we talk about her at all it's kind of like don't be Orpa or Orpa don't don't you know what I'm saying don't don't miss your blessing but I want to talk a little bit about maybe Orpa didn't miss her blessing maybe she was right where she was supposed to be so as I was looking up the Moabites like who is who is Mo, who are is Moab who are the Moabites um, so they are the descendants of Lot. So if y'all remember Lot, he was Abraham's nephew. So, you know, Abraham, the Lord told Abraham to go leave his kinfolk. Abraham did that and he brought a little extra, extra package. He brought Lot. Then, you know, all of that happened. They separated. Lot started his own thing, you know, any, anyway. Sodom and Gomorrah, this totally cliff note versions, blah, 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 blah. So Lot and his two daughters left, were, you know, brought out of Sodom and Gomorrah um, by the angels. Daughters ended up getting Lot drunk. Both had sex with him. Tell me out. The Bible, like I said two weeks ago or a month ago, the Bible is like the most scandalous story soap opera there is so they both had sex with their father and one of them produced moab so moab is the 
um, son of Lot by his own daughter. So for that reason and others, there's this contention and rivalry between the children of Israel and the Moabites. But also at the same time, though, there are times when they like work together. So there's stories in the Bible where um, like David, before he becomes king, he finds shelter and reprieve in the, you know, country of Moab when Saul is chasing him. So it's like, we don't like each other and there's just drama, but we work together when we have to. So so it's it's real contentious. And even with that, if Moab is really as bad as we kind of try to make it out to be, sorry, I have to sneeze. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, if it's as bad as we try to make it out to be, then why did Naomi and her husband go in there in the first place? Now, I get it. There's a famine. But was there nowhere else that you could go? But you all chose to go there. And then not only did they go there, they went there and they allowed their sons to pick wives from there. Maybe they didn't know how long they were going to be there. Maybe they were just like, well, you know, we just got to marry these these kids off and, you know, have grandkids and continue the lineage. But again, now when we talk about Orpah, we talk about her being a Moabite, Moabitess and, and deciding to go back to her, it's like it's bad. But maybe for them, Moab wasn't really that bad. Maybe Israel was better. But maybe Moab wasn't that bad. And so if you're if we're thinking about this history, this contentiousness between, you know, Israelites and, and Moabites, and we're thinking about, well, I was good enough to marry your, your husband, how might all of this have impacted Orpah's self-image? How might she have seen herself for the good? Or maybe the not so good. Maybe she's questioning herself and like, do I belong? Is this somewhere, you know, where I want to be? Am I gonna go there and get mistreated? Should I go back? So there, I feel like there's all this that backstory and all this history and all these other things going on with Orpa that we don't necessarily talk about. That may or may not be helpful. So the other thing I thought was interesting, and I kind of alluded to that, is that. Naomi gave Orpah her blessing. She said to her, hey, you're still relatively young. You know, if we remember, they were getting married when they were 12, 13, 14. So let's say she's in her mid-20s. Naomi is like, you can still get married. You can still have children. I don't want to prevent you from doing, th doing that. I am freely releasing you from any real or perceived responsibility from following behind me. And so if Naomi is okay with that, then why are we talking about it? Why, why are we talking about all these thousands and thousands and thousands of years later, like Orpah is bad, when she did what her elder offered to for her to do? How might that relate to us? People we know and love and respect and appreciate could be our parents, could be some other loved ones, could be some, you know, person in authority that we honor and respect. And they have given us their blessing. And yet someone completely outside the situation who knows nothing about what is going on has something to say about it. How, how, how does that work? What can we learn from Orpah? So... Let's share. I'm going to share just a couple of things because like I said, I'm trying to keep this to 30 minutes or less. There may be times in your walk, in your life, in your business, in your relationships, in your family, in your whatever, that you have to do what is best for you. It might not look like anybody else's journey. For Ruth, her following Naomi worked. That was what she needed to do. For Orpah, her journey, her path, her destiny 
could have been something totally different and that's okay that doesn't make it wrong it doesn't make it bad it doesn't make it the devil it doesn't make it you know the enemy it doesn't mean she's disobedient it doesn't mean she's not trusting god it doesn't it, it doesn't mean any of that it simply means that orpah like some of us are doing what we need to do at that point in our journey amen so don't, I would encourage us to not allow other people's perception of us or um, thoughts about us or thoughts about what we should do alter who we are or our path. If you have heard from God, if you have had a conversation with someone whose opinion you respect and you feel like you need to go on this particular path, go on it. That that's between you and Jesus. The other thing I think we could take away from Orpa is again, just kind of y'all know me. I'm abstract and I try to look at things from a different standpoint. Maybe Orpa's destiny was never to be a part of that family in the first place. Maybe Naomi and her family were actually a distraction for Orpa. Maybe. Or but not following Naomi was actually her getting back on her track that she was supposed to be on. I mean, we don't know. We don't hear about Orpa <laughs> after she goes back to her family. But for all we know, she went back. She met the Moabite version of Boaz and had a great life. We have no idea. We have no idea. We have no idea, no clue what happened to Orpa. It may have been great. She may have had equally an exciting story to share with her family, her friends, her loved ones that we just don't happen to know about. And so I just want to encourage us as we talk about, um, thank you, Naja, as we talk about these real housewives of the bible that it may not look like there are pieces one that we won't know because we have the bible but we don't have every single thing that happened in the bible so there could be things that not could be there are definitely things that happen that we know nothing about and so um for my theologians i i, I never remember i know one is exegesis and one is the, the other ex word but like we kind of put our our thoughts and our perceptions and our modern day um interpretations on the word so when we read ruth now i feel like or at least the messages i've heard when Oprah is even mentioned is kind of like i said earlier here are there um black or white ruth is great Oprah is bad and I think we should not do that. I think we should not do that to Orpa and therefore not do it to ourselves. Not do it to people that we know. If their journey is a little bit different, it's okay. Orpa's journey was okay. And it was what she needed to do for her. So, that's it. That's all I got for you tonight. So, we talked about if you're just popping on. Um, catching the last tail end this quarter series is on the real housewives of the bible and two weeks ago we talked about Miriam. tonight we talked about orpa i'll be back in two weeks um with another housewife of the bible um so i hope you guys are enjoying this series enjoying this topic feel free to let me know if you are if you um, in the future for next quarter or the next quarter or the next quarter I want to hear something different comment send me a dm would love to hear from you guys so as i'm signing off again just want to mention check out drchalet.com you can order your copy of love letters to our sons or any of the um, devotionals that i have available if you're in the area or are planning on being in the area, you can go ahead and register for Roar Like a Lioness. That's happening on April 15th. And then I've mentioned a couple of other um, events and conferences and things that are coming up that I know I'm going to be a part of. And I would love to see you there. So. 
This is great. I learned a lot. Hope you did as well. I'm going to go ahead and sign off. So I pray that you all have a great night. Thank you again for hanging out with me. I know you don't have to do that. So thank you for taking the time to do that. So I love you guys. Be blessed. Dr. S.